Now, I'm going to just give a little bit, a little bit of theological background. I'm going to speak about the rise of what the, comes under the umbrella term of liberal theology. Don't get confused with liberal politics. I'm talking about liberal theology. Liberal theology rose really to prominence in the, started in the 18th century, but in the, nine, eight, in the 19th and 20th centuries, our academic institutions in the West, Germany and Britain in particular, faculties of theology in our universities, there was this rise of liberal theology. And at the heart of it all were schools of criticism. And criticism, not in the sense of saying, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. Criticism in terms of a, a, a discipline, a tool uh, that, you, that is used to seek to understand the Bible further. Some of them a lot more helpful than others. I'm not going to go into them, but actually something about them is indicated just from what they're, they're, where they're called. So the schools of criticism, textual criticism, source criticism, form criticism, in my view the least helpful because of its presuppositions, redaction, editing criticism, who edited all this stuff, and literary criticism. And the rise of the liberal theology in Germany, uh, German theologians and British theologians at the forefront, has given rise, I would suggest to you, to some pretty odd forms of belief within the church and sometimes without, and pretty odd forms of unbelief as well. And these things, this movement, this inbuilt tension in the church between those who have got a critical stroke sceptical view of scripture and those who have a very high view of scripture has been going on for a long, long time. But it's, and whilst we've had people like, I don't know, the former Bishop of Durham, David Jenkins, they used to whip him out every Easter because everybody knew the Bishop of, then Bishop of Durham didn't believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so the BBC sort of stuck him on every year for many years. Everybody knew what he didn't believe, but you really did need a degree in theology to even understand what he did believe. It was so complex. So, but the thing is about the rise of liberal theology, it has never got to the point where there's been a major alteration in the doctrine and teaching of the church and practice of the church because of it. So I'm going to just to illustrate this, I came across something in Wikipedia. Don't judge me. Wikipedia is all right. Uh, but one of the things Wikipedia does is tries to make things accessible to ordinary readers like you and me. So this is Wikipedia having a go at something around liberal theology. Rudolf Bultmann, gosh, he's hard to understand, German theologian, and this is Wikipedia's offering on him. It says this, uh, and, a, and, and an icon figure in, in liberal theology and biblical criticism. Rudolf Bultmann, a giant of 20th century New Testament biblical criticism. His pioneering studies in biblical criticism shaped research on the composition of the Gospels and his call for the demythologizing of biblical language sparked debate among Christian theologians worldwide. Boltman's demythologizing refers to the reinterpretation of biblical myths. Myths in Boltman's framework are defined as descriptions of the divine in human language. That's a lot of the Bible. Myths in, in that framework. He continues, it's not the elimination of myth, but is instead its re-expression in terms of existential philosophy. Borman claimed that myths are true anthropologically and existentially, but not cosmologically. That's Wikipedia trying to make Boltman accessible. That resonated with us. <laughs> we had to write essays and answer exam questions on this stuff. So I, I, I stand before you to say, I'm not alone in this, my experience of liberal theology, because where, well, whatever college you went to, you had to read this stuff and be able to answer questions on it. My experience is sometimes it can be interesting. My experience is also its proponents are sincere and very often lovely people. But I'll be straight, I've never found it anything other than spiritually sterile. And at its heart, 
it has an arrogance. And I've found that all over. Now, let me explain what I mean. I'm not saying that the proponents are arrogant people. Generally, they're not. The ones I've met in this diocese and beyond can be very humble, affable, self-deprecating, nice people. The arrogance is that there is a human construct, sort of an intellectual filter, forms of criticism through which the living word of God must pass this human construct that we have through which the living word of God must pass to be really understood. You know, people in the pew, God loves simple, you know, we were all there once type attitude, but really to apply the Bible, you must apply these critical tools. It's absolutely naive to take the Bible at face, lang face value almost anywhere. The plain reading of the text is very often wrong for them. Scripture, for the liberal theologian, is full of deliberately contradictory writing. Anyone who seeks to harmonize what you find in the Bible is completely missing the point. I remember that point being made powerfully at one of my two theological colleges. What they would say is we have to look all of this, use the critical tools, and draw out underlying principles, which are normally fairly vague. Principles like covenant and love. Uh, draw them out from the scripture using the critical tools, and then apply them under the leading of the Holy Spirit, they would say, to the situation that we're in today. The trouble is, more often than not, that ends up completely contradicting what the original readers heard and what anybody looking at the plain meaning of the text would see. It's complex. This complex, almost exclusive, cerebral theology, I would contrast with the words of Scripture itself, indeed with the words of Jesus. Luke 10 Verse 21, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this is what you were pleased to do. Matthew 18, 3, Jesus again, and he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like an academic theologian, no, like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And finally, I'm going to refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Very important for me, this one. It was part of my calling to ordain ministry. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. We need to remember that God chose, as Jesus' apostles, fishermen and tax collectors, and not academic theologians. And there were plenty available at the time, but none of them were chosen. And generally, they were the adversaries. God speaks through his holy word by his Holy Spirit to individuals and to the church. There are huge dangers for those whose intellectual brilliance brings a spiritual arrogance, even if they have personal humility. You end up in a position where really, when you get to the nub of it, only the scholarly elite can really interpret the scripture properly and apply it to life. That's where you end up. How little the Holy Spirit was referred to in too many of the painfully dry lectures I went through at my second theological college. They weren't all like that. There were some really good ones as well. So where am I leading you in this little rant I've just had, if you want to view it that way? I hope it's not. 
Is this just like an anti-intellectual rant? Am I calling for some cultural revolution where we get rid of all intelligent people, sweep them aside and go back to some sort of crazy fundamentalism? No, I'm not. You'll be relieved perhaps to hear. Faith and scholarship is alive and well. I'm going to illustrate this by indulging myself and informing you of some of my heroes. Now, I know Ian and Steve, there are great heroes of the Christian faith who aren't Anglican, many and great ones. It just so happens all mine are Anglicans. It's, it's inevitable really, isn't it? Surprise. What a surprise. There you are. Two that aren't with us any longer. John Stott, formative thinker, in recent times changed the direction of the um, Church of England, I would believe. He was a key person in stopping many evangelicals leaving at one point, and a great thinker and a great theologian. His commentary on Acts is my favourite commentary on that book. C.S. Lewis, the prophetic great apologist in the English language. He's been long gone. 1963 he died, yet constantly quoted. What a wonderful Christian apologist with a deep faith and an amazing intellect honed through personal suffering. Now along the bottom, these people are alive and kicking. Alistair McGrath, great guy. He holds the Andreas, oh sorry, Andreas Idros Professorship of Science and Religion in the Faculty of Theology and Religion at Oxford University. He's a Doctor of Physics and Theology. How about that for a combination? Brilliant author, great speaker, superb apologist, wonderful, wonderful man, a great. You see, these people have got faith and intellect in balance. Their intellect hasn't become God, God's remained God. The guy on the other side, people are already speaking about Tom Wright, uh, former Bishop of Durham, author of countless commentaries, as possibly the greatest theologian alive in the English-speaking world. He is amazing. You may not have heard of him. This man is of massive influence. He is a profound theologian, but a live wire with God's spirit as well. Wonderful man. Now, the woman in the middle, you're not going to know. You may have heard me refer to her, Christina Baxter. Uh, Dr. Christie, she was actually chair of General Synod, lay chair of General Synod for quite a while. She was dean of St. John's Nottingham when I was there, and she later became its principal. Uh, this woman had a huge impact on me. She was the one, those of you that were at the discipleship course, she would get groups of students, and she would get us totally convinced of a doctrinal point. It would be maybe eight to ten of us. And she was so persuasive, and we'd all be going, yes, Christina, we've got it, we've got it. Once she'd got us all there, she would utterly dismantle what she'd just convinced us of. And I learned so much by going through this slightly painful, embarrassing experience with the wonderful, witty, and uh, lovely woman of faith, Christina Baxter. A little bit too in love with the Book of Common Prayer, possibly, but a wonderful woman nonetheless. So faith and academia are powerful, um, but I can't say I'm going to share anything especially positive about the fruits of liberal theology. I'm not talking about the individuals concerned. The rise of liberal theology in the Western Protestant Church, along with the cultural pressures, are bringing us to a crisis point. The reason this debate is so significant is that much of the church is saying that the redefining of marriage and family that same-sex marriages in church would imply would mark such a profound departure from scripture that the church would inevitably split 